Okay. Um, let's get started. Does the lack of masks mean that COVID has left your household? COVID has at the moment left my household, yes. Um, thank God. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Tonight is part 22 in our series on the um, first chapter of Sanhedrin. We're going to spend almost all of tonight on page 11a, but we will get a little bit at the end into page 11b. We are starting on a tangent and then we will come back to the topic we've been dealing with for a while, which is the um, uh, addition of a leap month to a year and the procedure for doing that. Um, and I will do my best since we have some new people and we have some people who haven't been here for a while. I'll do my best to explain everything thoroughly as we go along. It shouldn't be terribly dependent on the previous classes. If you are listening to this in a recording at some point in the future, feel free to contact me at debraclapper at gmail.com. For that matter, those of you who are here in person are also welcome to email me. Um, everybody should have gotten the packet by email earlier today. If you did not, let me know and I'll put you on the list for the future. Okay. Um, here we are. Tani Rabbanan. Misha metu nivi'im ha'achronim, Chagai, Zechariah, Umalachi, Nistalka, Ruach HaKodesh, Mi'Yisrael. So we begin by asserting that when the last of the prophets died, that would be Chagai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the Holy Spirit left um, Israel. And it's important to know that, as usual, in any text that's more than 100 or so years old, Israel means the people Israel, unless it says otherwise. Um, unlike today, where Israel without a, a qualifier would mean the location. Um, but that's a relatively recent change in the use of language. Nonetheless, they did use a batkol, um, which seems to mean that they had some sort of direct communication with God that was somehow not prophecy, but does give them messages. And this is called a batko. Exactly what that means, I have no idea. But um, let's read these stories. So, Pamachat, Hayumisubim Baaliyat, Beit Guria Biricho. So, once they, some group of rabbis, is reclining in the upstairs of the house of Guria, or possibly a place called Beit Guria, um, in the city of Jericho. And a, a batkol was uh, presented itself to them from the heavens. Um, there is one among you who uh, is worthy that the Shekhinah would rest on him like Moshe. But his generation doesn't quite deserve for that to happen. He deserves for it to happen. But the generation doesn't deserve it, and the implication is, so it's not going to happen. Um, this is a little bit problematic because we, theoretically, believe that nobody is capable of um, prophecy the way that Moshe got prophecy. That seems to be the straightforward meaning of what God tells Aaron and Miriam about Moshe's prophecy. And so I, it, it would seem that this is an exaggeration, but that is what it says. So the sages turned and looked at, at Hillel Hazakain. It seemed obvious to them that that's who the heavenly voice was talking about. Fast forward to the end of Hillel Hazakain's life. Kishimit Amrulav, they said about him when he died, Hey Hasid, hey Anav, Ezra. What a pious person, what a humble person, a student of Ezra. I assume that he got a normal length eulogy, and this is just a summary. Um, but it, it seems like that's that's a very uh, uh, strong eulogy. Okay. Then another time they were reclining in the upstairs in a uh, building in Yavne, 
and possibly this is the building where the rabbis met in the yeshiva in Yavne, or possibly this is someplace else in Yavne, I don't know. And a heavenly voice, a batkol, came to them from heaven. There's one here who's worthy to have the Shechina rest on him. But his generation isn't worthy. Same message as the last time. And again, it's worth noting that the batkol does not tell them who. But again, they think they know who. The Chachamim turned and looked at Shmuel HaKatan, and this may be why this piece is here, because we had some stories about the um, moral greatness of Shmuel HaKatan last week, and, and it may be that, that that's the connection between this tangent and that one. Fast forward now to the death of Shmuel HaKatan. Kishamit amru alav hei chasid hei anav talmidosh hilo. They said about him, what a pious person, what a humble person, a student of Hillel. So they're connecting Shmuel HaKatan to Hillel. They think these are the two people who were should have been prophets, but couldn't be because they lived in a time when the Jewish people didn't deserve prophecy. And in fact, we have a statement that Shmuel HaKatan made as he was dying, which seems to be intended as a prophecy, and it seems to connect to things that happened afterwards. So I think the Gemara is taking it as a prophecy. It's a little strange that we're asserting that, well, there's no prophecy, but sometimes people spout prophecies anyway. Like That seems like an odd juxtaposition, uh, and it's hard to know exactly what then is meant by there's no prophecy, but so be it. Um, so what he said when he was dying is, Shimon vi Ishmael l'charava. This is definitely not good news. Shimon, that's Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, who we met uh, last week with his opinions about how to um, vote on the on the ad addition of the leap month. He's the one who said in who had said in the Mishnah that you start with three judges and then you go to five judges and then finally the decision is made by seven judges. Same Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. So Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel and Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, who is the Kohen Gadol at the same time, I believe, as Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel is the Nasi, um, they will both die by the sword. V'chavrohi le'katala and their colleagues, their fellows, will be put to death by other death penalties. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, horrible ways that the Roman Empire had of putting people to death. If you're curious and you don't remember it clearly, by all means, go to either the um, Tisha B'Av keynote or to the uh, passages in Musaf on Yom Kippur that we sort of mumble. In both places, there are um, a list of the 10 martyrs, including Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha and Rabbi Shmuel ben Gamliel, I think, um, and their methods of death. They're pretty horrible. In any case, I'm not going into detail here, but Shmuel HaKatan is said here to have predicted their deaths. Vishar Ama Labiza and the rest of the people will be plundered. The Akan Segian Atidan Lamiti Al Alma. And great trouble, or our great trouble, will be brought, Lamiti Al Alma, will be brought to the world. That, if you're going to be allowed to give one prophecy, that's probably not the one you want to give, but it's what he had. Okay. Al Yehuda ben Baba who I believe should be Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, but he's not here. And, and on Yehuda ben Baba, they wanted to say a similar eulogy, like they said about uh, Shmuel HaKatan and Hillel. Uh, what, a, what, what a pious person, what a humble person, a student of, and whoever his teacher was. But they couldn't. Because El Nitrifa Sha'a, the, the, the moment was torn up, which apparently means the opportunity was lost. She'ain must be deem al haruge malchut because you can't eulogize those executed by the king. Uh, presumably because if you act like you think the king made a mistake in executing people, the king would be perfectly happy to add to his list of people that he's executing, and you'd prefer not to be on his hit list. Um, and you just want to stay out of the way when the king is out there killing people. Uh, but apparently Yehuda ben Baba had the kind of respect that would have resulted in that kind of eulogy had it been possible. 
Tanu Rabbanan. Back on top. We only impregnate the year if the Nasi agrees. Reminding you that the months of the Hebrew calendar are based on the moon. And the moon cycle around the earth is only 29 and a half days long. So 12 lunar cycles, 12 cycles of the moon is 354 days. That is uh, 11 and a quarter days shorter than the cycle of the earth around the sun, which is 365 and a quarter days. And therefore, if you don't do something and just have 12 lunar months for each year, you're the um, two calendars aren't going to stay in sync and the holidays won't be in the right seasons anymore. And so approximately seven out of every 19 years in order to make the arithmetic come out right, you need to add an extra month so that you have a 13 month year. We in fact are at this very moment sitting here in the leap month of this year. The month that we're in right now, Adar Aleph is a month that only exists because this year is a leap, leap year. Um, and the in the time of the Mishnah and part of the time of the Gemara, they were still deciding year to year, they were sitting down, not the, exactly this time of year, but like three weeks ago time of year to make the decision about whether the next month would be an extra month or whether it would be the real Adar that would have Purim in it. Um, so the, uh, that decision can only be made if the Nasi agrees. The Nasi is the hereditary head of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the hereditary line has in it such people as Hillel and Rabban Shimu ben Gamliel, who we met a few minutes ago, and his son, Rabban Gamliel, who we'll meet later this evening, and Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, who edited the Mishnah. All of those people are in a, right, their grand, grandfather and great grandfather and so on of, in the same line. Um, and they claim to trace their lineage back to King David. So this is in the time of the mission of the closest you have to a monarchy, I guess, uh, for the Jewish people. In any case, the Nasi has veto power over this decision to add another month to the year. And it happens that we have a story about this. Uma said Rabban Gamliel. It happened once with Rabban Gamliel. Shehalachli told Rishut Etzel Hegmon Echad Shebesuria. He went to ask permission from an official, or a Hegmon, as it says here, right? the, the same word that English gets the word hegemony from um, in Syria. To, and apparently not something related to the calendar. He's just going to get permission for something related to the Jewish community. He's on a, a, you know, a business trip uh, related to his position as Nasi. And he was late coming back. And they had to make a decision and he wasn't there. So So they made a conditional uh, impregnating of the year. They made the the year, and they gave an extra month to the year. And they said, "We're only do we'll only do this if Rabban Gamliel agrees when he gets back." Um, then Rabban Gamliel got back, and he said, "Yeah, I agree. It sounds like a good idea." Then it turned out that what they had already done worked, and the year was impregnated. Okay. By the way, probably that term impregnate is there to describe a leap year because a leap year is bigger than normal. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything mysterious happening in that particular idiom. Okay, Tanu Rabbanan, En ma briyant hashana, ela imkein haitat sricha. So this is a, a relatively long brighta, so bear with me. But we only impregnate the year if it is necessary because of the following things. Because of the roads, and because of the, the bridges, and because of the, uh, the ovens for roasting the Korban Pesach. And all three of those things are things that could have been or probably were damaged in the winter rains. And you have to fix them before Pesach can effectively happen because the roads and the bridges need to be fixed so that the pilgrims can get to Yerushalayim. And the um, ovens have to be fixed so that people can roast all of those lambs on Arab Pesach. 
um, Galiot Yisrael Shenehakrumim Koman Vadayin Lo Higiu. And because of the exiles of Israel, Jewish people from outside of the land of Israel, who have already left home, but didn't arrive yet. Um, so I guess these people are traveling for a long way because they have, uh, they're, it's not yet Nisan and possibly not yet even Adar, and they're already traveling for Pesach, and we know that they are already not going to make it in time for Pesach. That's a really, really dedicated pilgrim. Okay, Avalo, but we do not impregnate the year because of the following. Not because of snow and not because of cold. And not from because of people from outside of Israel who didn't leave home. Okay, so the, the weather that might get in the way of the uh, pilgrims arriving we, is not a good enough reason, and the pilgrims who haven't left home yet are not a good enough reason, I suppose, because if they haven't left home yet and they're not going to make it in time, they should just stay home. Um, the, the, that's not quite enough of an emergency. Okay, but now we have another list here. Tani Rabbanan, in ma'abriyan tashana, lo mibnei gdiim, velo mibnei tlaim, can't impregnate the year because of goats or because of lambs or because of baby birds. And the thing is that when everybody arrives in Yerushalayim for the holiday, it, they, need, they need goats and lambs, baby goats and baby lambs to bring the Korban Pesach, but they also need them to bring all of the other sacrifices that need to be brought. And they need to bring um, various other sacrifices, um, the various other sacrifices, which will include a, quite a large number of birds, in particular, um, the um, sacrifices brought by women who've given birth since the last holiday, which presumably is quite a few over the course of the winter, is going to involve two birds um, and there are a number of others. And the concern here is that you might actually not have enough of a supply of animals of the right size and age if Pesach is too early, because last year's animals might be too old and this year's animals aren't old enough, and you might actually just not have enough animals. But that is apparently not by itself a good enough reason to add a month to the year. Um, yes, Kevin, thank you. The reason why we are satisfied for the people who haven't left home yet to simply stay home and not arrive at all if they can't make it in time is because if the Torah says explicitly that if you are too far away to travel for Pesach, then you should come for Pesach Shani. So that seems like that's a, that's a, it's a possibility that has already been accounted for in the halacha, and we don't need to move Pesach for those people because God already took care of that one. Um, thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, so we don't use the animals not being old enough as a reason to add a month about Usinotan Sa'ad Lashana, but we do use them as a supporting factor. Meaning once we already are feeling like maybe it's a good idea because eh, the roads are kind of iffy and there's a bridge that's collapsed and we might have time to fix it, but we might not. Then you go look at the animals and you're like, uh, well, yeah, if we we're gonna have plenty of animals, so then I might say, yeah, we'll, we'll hurry up and we'll manage it. But since the amount of animals and we're not sure about the roads, so like the two things together are, are enough. Okay, Kate said, so how does that work? So we have actually, Rabbi Yanai quotes um, an actual, it seems to be an actual uh, proclamation about a, uh, a leap year. So Rabbi Yanai Omer Mishum Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel. Rabbi Yanai quoted Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel as saying the as issuing the following proclamation: Mehodain Anachna Lechon. We notify you, the Gozlaya Rechichin, that the chicks are too tender, too young. 
the imra de akrin and the lambs are too skinny the zimna de aviva lomata and the time of spring has not come so it sounds like those are two three separate things there aren't going to be birds and there aren't going to be lambs and the season is wrong okay vishi parat milta anpai and it the thing uh, was good in my in my opinion um, or in front of me the osifit alshata and alshata da and i add to this year piltin yomi 30 days so this um this seems to be just you know like a text that you would write down on a bunch of pieces of parchment and send them out in as letters to the various communities to let them know that Pesach and Purim are delayed a month this year. Note, by the way, that with a calendar this way, you can never make plans in advance. Because as much as we talk about the Jewish holidays moving around on the calendar, oh, the Chagim are very late this year, the Chagim are very early this year. Oh, I hate it when Pesach is, has, Erev Pesach is on Shabbat, that kind of thing. He, we're talking here about a system in which you actually really actually have no way of knowing when the holidays are until shortly before they happen, which has got to be infinitely more inconvenient. So we should have some gratitude that at least how, however, however much our holidays move around, at least we can watch them move around in advance and we know where they're going to land. Okay, Metive. They suggested a tiyuvta. A tiyuvta is when the rabbis of the Gemara, who we call the Amoraim, seem to have contradicted the uh, rabbis of the Mishnah, who we call the Tanaim, um, because it's the job of the Amoraim to interpret and explain the Tanaim. They're not al they're allowed to take sides in a dispute between Tanaim, but they're not allowed to contradict. In this particular case, it seems that the thing about which there is a contradiction which is a little unusual, is not actually the law, it's what somebody said. Nonetheless, the, the, the overall structure stands. So they suggest it's Yuvta, and then right after that, you get the quote that seems to be contradicting. Kama ibur shanash loshim yom. And we have an anonymous position that says, how much do you add when you make a leap year? You add 30 days. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel omer chodesh. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says you add a month. Which Rashi says, we presume that a month, unless we're told otherwise, is 29 days long. Now, the thing is that Rabbi Yanai, just a minute ago, quoted Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel as sending out a proclamation saying that he was, uh, that he was adding 30 days to the year. So it would seem that this Brita that we quoted down here underneath the Metive is contradicting Rabbi Yanai about what Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel thinks is the correct number of days to add to a leap year. Um, so Rav Papa gets us out of this mess, though. Am Rav Papa, Ratsu Chodesh, Ratsu Shloshim Yom. Rav Papa says, actually, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel's position wasn't that you have to add exactly 29 days. He's responding to the people who said 30 days. And he's saying, well, you could do that if you want to, or you could do 29 days, either one, it's fine. Right? And so then, you know, it happened in that particular year that because of the phase of the moon or because of how long they thought it was going to take the animals to mature and the bridges to get fixed or whatever, they added 30 days. But he doesn't think it always has to be that way. He thinks it's at the discretion of the beta. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, it's worth noting that Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel in his text up here said that he, that he announced this um, impregnation of the year in the first person. It is good in, my, in front of me. I am adding, right? It seems like he has, is taking responsibility for the decision. Even though the sentence begins as weak, Right, you might have thought I made a mistake in translating, but no, that's what it says. Mehodein anachna means we are notifying, but we are notifying you that I have made the decision. 
is is the text of his of his proclamation. So we're going to get into that a little. Tahazi mai ika ben tikifai kadmai la the invitani batra. Come and see the difference between the original rabbis, the first rabbis, the older rabbis who were more assertive, and the later rabbis who are more humble. The time, because we have a bright. So we have a story about Rabban Gamliel, who is the son of Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. And yes, I know that's confusing because Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel's father is also named Rabban Gamliel. As it happens, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel's grandfather is also named Rabban Shimon, you know, just to make life interesting. Um, it, it, they keep recycling the same names over and over again in this family. Um, and, but this Rabban Gamliel is the son of the Rabban Shimon Gamliel that we had up above. So we have a story about Rabban Gamliel, that he's sitting on a step on the Temple Mount. Um, and and that, that uh, scribe, Yochanan, was standing in front of him. And in front of him are lying three cut pieces of parchment, presumably blank pieces of parchment. Um, Amar Lo. So Raman Gamil says, Tol Igar pick up one of these parchments, Uchto, and write the following. Laachana Bene Galila Ila, to our brothers, the people of the Upper Galilee, Ulaachana Bene Galila Tata, and to our, um, our brothers, the uh, people of Lower Galilee. Shlomachon Yaske, may your peace be great. We are notifying you and we're notifying you that the time of biur has come. The time of, well, biur normally means getting rid of something or burning something. Right? We are in another two and a half months going to make the bracha al biur chametz right before we do bidikat chametz, it's really the bracha on the burning of the chametz the next day. Um, this is not exactly that. This is biur maaser, which is the getting rid of the last of your tithes that you're by now supposed to have delivered, but you're supposed to get rid of them by delivering them. If you don't, you have to destroy them, but you're not supposed to burn your tithes. You're supposed to distribute them to the levy and to the poor person, if whoever was supposed to get this particular chunk of produce. Um, so the time of of the getting rid of slash distributing has arrived um, to and it's time to separate maser from your uh, tanks of olives, your vats of olives. I suppose they grew a lot of olives in the Galilee. I don't know. Um, and then he turns to the scribe and he says, and take another piece of parchment and write the following. He said, to our, my brother, our brothers in the South, may your peace be great. Uh, we're letting you know that the time of biur has come, the time of getting rid of your tithes has arrived. And it's time to um, separate the tithes from your barley sheets. Right? This is the religious version of a letter from the IRS telling, reminding you that uh, it's time to get your tax return filed. Um, but remember, with the calendar not being uh, stable, <laughs> It may in fact be that you need a central proclamation about when it is that you're supposed to do your tithes because you actually might not know otherwise. Um, okay. And he says, and then take another piece of parchment and write the following. And it sounds, which is a little weird, like Rabban Galil and the scribe are the only two people there. So uh, presumably, 
a legislative body has met and decided that this is supposed to happen, and Rabban Gamliel is just like sticking around to finish the paperwork. Uh, but it doesn't actually say that, which I, I, is interesting. In any case, he says, and take, take the last piece of parchment and write the following. To our brothers the, in the uh, exile in Babylonia, and to our brothers who are in, the, in Medea, and all of the other exiles of Israel, may your, your peace be great forever. Um, and if he's sending this letter to all of the different exiles, I assume that they're writing it on one piece of parchment and then it goes somewhere to be copied a bunch of times because it's hard to picture that this one piece of parchment is going everywhere. Um, but we don't get that image on screen here. We're notifying you. Uh, sorry. We're notifying you. That the the chicks are uh, young, the imra akrin, and the lambs are skinny. The zimra de aviva lomata, and the time of spring has not come. This seems to be basically this, other than the fact that it's addressed to the uh, to the various exiles. This seems to be basically the same letter that his father sent. Veshafra milta anpai uve anpei chavrai chaverai. And the matter is good in, in front of me and in front of my colleagues, the Osifit al Shata da Yamin Silti. And I am adding to this year 30 days. Okay, so but notice that while uh, Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel, his father, took all of the responsibility for everything on himself. It was all, you know, I have decided, I am doing, it seems appropriate to me. Here, Rabban Gamliel has put it on himself and on his colleagues, who don't seem to be here while they're writing the letter, but um, that's the, the text of the letter does reference colleagues. But we resolve that by saying, Dilma Batar de Avruhu. Maybe this is after they had removed him. Now we need to go back a moment to a story which those of you who were in this class a year and a half ago, when it first started, we did do the story together, but I think the overlap between that class and now is pretty minimal. So I'm going to tell the story. Um, so this is a story that's told in Brachot although there are pieces of it that are in, in Bechorot and in Rosh Hashanah, where uh, Rabban Gamliel is teaching and he's asked, is it net obligatory to say Mariv or is it optional? And he says it's obligatory. And then there's like some kind of conversation and it comes to light that privately, that Rabbi Yehoshua really thinks that it's optional. So the next day in class, a student raises his hand and says, hey, Rabbi Gamliel, uh, Rabbi Yehoshua told me that it's optional to say Marv. So Rabbi Gamliel turns to Rabbi Yehoshua and says, Rabbi Yehoshua, stand up. Did you say this? And in the end, Rabbi Yehoshua's response is a little weird. He actually seems to be wishing uh, the student who has accused him to be dead so that he could um, just deny it. The, the, the idioms there are a little strange. I don't fully understand them. But the end result is that Yoshua admits that he, in fact, disagrees with Rabban Gamliel. And Rabban Gamliel won't give him permission to sit down again or to leave. And so Rabbi Yoshua is stuck standing there all day during the class and the proceedings of the Sanhedrin and whatever else is happening. And in fact, this is the third time that Rabban Gamliel has deliberately humiliated Rabbi Yoshua. Uh, once in over an issue uh, in Bechorot, I think the issue there, no, I'm gonna get it wrong, but there's an, an issue in Bechorot where they had had a similar disagreement and Rabban Gamliel makes him stand all day then also. 
And there's a case in Rosh Hashanah where they, Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua disagreed about whether a particular pair of witnesses were lying about having seen the moon. And Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel accepts them and lets them testify and says, okay, today is Rosh Hashanah. And Rabbi Yoshua says they're clearly lying. Um, and in fact, there's no moon the next night. So it seems like, in fact, Rabbi Yoshua was right. They were lying, but that doesn't seem to be the point. And that one, Rabbi Gamliel asserts his authority by demanding that Rabbi Yoshua show up in the marketplace carrying his stick and his wallet publicly on the day that Rabbi Yoshua thinks is Yom Kippur. Um, and so by the time you get to this case about the dispute about whether Mari was optional or required, the other people have had enough. And they tell uh, Chutzpit, who's the, the, what they call the Maturgaman, he's the guy whose job it is to shout what the lecturer says louder so that people can, under, can hear him. Because remember, this is before there were microphones. They tell Chutzpit to be quiet. And Chutzpit stops repeating what Rabban Gamliel is saying. And uh, so effectively they turned off his microphone. And Rabbi Gamliel can't teach anymore. And instead of listening to him teach, they have a meeting in which they decide to remove him as, as Nasi. And he goes home in shame. They appoint uh, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria instead, who is uh, 18 years old at this moment and has no gray hair. And then in order to give him some dignity, his gray hair, his hair miraculously turns gray overnight, which is how you get him in the Haggadah and Pesach saying, it's as if I am 70 years old, right? Which seems, at least according to this story, to mean not I, it, I'm about 70 years old, which is the way the Haggadah I had as a child translated it, but I'm 18, but I look 70. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, eventually Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel, when he realizes how badly he's hurt Rabbi Yoshua, he goes to Rabbi Yoshua's house to apologize. And he looks around and he says, wow, I had no idea you were a blacksmith, but I can tell from the blackened walls of your house that you must be a blacksmith. And Rabbi Yoshua says, you know, it's really not so good when the leadership of the people don't even quite know what their colleagues do for a living, much less how normal people live their lives. Um, but in the end, Rabbi Gamliel is able to appease Rabbi Yoshua and they make peace between them. And Rabbi Yoshua is able to send a message back to everybody else saying that he's not hurt anymore and they should let Rabbi Gamliel back inside. But at that point, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah has already been the Nasi for some period of time and they don't feel like it's appropriate to remove him from the position since he didn't do anything wrong. He, you know, stepped into pinch hit in an emergency and the, he shouldn't, you know, now be fired when he didn't do anything wrong. So what they do is they, uh, they make Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria the Nasi for one week out of every four and Rabbi Gamaliel is the Nasi for the other weeks out of every, of the other three weeks out of each, every four. So you end up for the rest of Rabbi Gamaliel's life that he's Nasi, but he's not the only Nasi. And so what the Gemara here is saying is it might not be, as we had assumed, that Rabbi Gamliel has less self-confidence. And that's why he's writing this letter in the name of himself and his colleagues. It might in fact be that he does, it's not really his colleagues plural, it's really that there's more than one Nasi and he doesn't have the authority to write the letter under his own name exclusively because he's not the only person with veto power. And if he and Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria both have veto power, then maybe he's the main Nasi. He's the three out of every four week Nasi. But Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria is enough also the Nasi to prevent Rabban Gamliel from doing anything unilateral. And since he can't do anything unilaterally, he also can't send out a letter under his own name with nobody else's name in it, and possibly to preserve his dignity, rather than saying, I, 
and Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, who they appointed to replace me because I was mean to somebody. Instead, he just wrote I and my colleagues um, in order to, uh, to save face. Um, so in the end, it may not be that we're actually experiencing a historical trend like the Gemara initially thought, and it may be that the standard text is, would still be the text that Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel used, and the text Rabban Gamliel used is particular to his own uh, particular circumstances. Okay, I feel like I went through that a little bit faster than I meant to, uh, but that is what I have for this evening. Um, I would be happy to take questions. Nothing from me this time. I was about to say Mindy must not be here this week. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Well, sorry, sorry to disappoint you. No, nothing jumped out okay. at me this time. That's okay. I apologize for ending a little bit early. I usually I, I get the timing better. Um, but okay. If you think of something, feel free to email me. I will. See you guys next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.